Bulala villages want fast track of land titles commission hearing. Japanese embassy donates over 800 million kina for classrooms. And sports minister assures venues will be ready for the FIFA under 20. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Tuesday's news. First in Parliament's news, landowner benefits from the LNG project came up again this afternoon with questions to the Prime Minister as to when these funds will be available to the landowners. While the Prime Minister said all landowner monies are still tied up due to court cases, Kikori MP Mark Maipakai insisted that Kikori landowners should be given their benefits as they have no cases with the courts. Kikori people is not taking court order or any other thing for that matter. Our case is a clear one. So my question to you, Prime Minister, is very direct. When will the Kikori people get their pay, pay out? Because we can't be caught in the Southern Island activities. We are pipeline landowners. The agreement is very specific. So I stand here on behalf of my people. Uh, Mr. Spe Speaker, these benefits come out from a single project. Uh, that is the LNG project. We have to discharge all our obligations to the landowners fairly and equally and at the same time. Uh, that is where we are, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we cannot pick and choose. Uh, I'm not in the business of picking and choosing. Uh, we, th that money is not going to be mismanaged. It has been uh, managed by central bank. Uh, it will be there for their taking, and, and it will be paid out when the issues that are there are being uh, resolved uh, amicably. Opposition leader Don Pollier has questioned the government on the cost of hosting the Asia-Pacific Economic Community Summit in 2018. Polly's question follows two different figures, he said, which were announced during the parliament sitting this afternoon. The question was directed to the Prime Minister. Mall were confusion areas long APEC meeting. Mr. Polier was the last member of parliament to ask a question in today's first day of the last session for the year. He wanted the prime minister to give the actual amount that will be spent on hosting the APEC summit in 2018. One and through through cost, this is a two figure here. I'm all working with one block and cost here now. Me plan must not got speculation along all these figures here. You justify him cost and talk all same. This is the effect by current kind of benefit also by come up. Now, me plan by cost him this money, spend him the return plan by all the same. Suppose by spending 200 million kin also prime minister talk, or 600 million kin also minister talk, one money me go, okay, me plan by spend him all the same, but income, the investment return by me plan kiss him one kind also one billion or two billion, kind of same all must give him. In response, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill said PNG has been an APEC member for 25 years but has never hosted a summit. Thus, the summit will put PNG on the world map and the opposition should support the idea. Mr. Speaker, let me say this about the APEC meeting. You see the business community who will be here. These 21 or 22, including Papua New Guinea, 22 countries control 50% of the world's trade. World's trade, Mr. Speaker. What an opportunity for Papua New Guinea. Don Polier will not create a job. Karenga Kua is not going to create a job. These are these investments that we are going to get from these people. Mr. Speaker, how are you going to employ Papua New Guineans? How are you going to create opportunities for them? Mr. Speaker, at the APEC, Mr. Speaker, we are not building anything new. Mr. Speaker, we are building only the APEC house, which is going to cost 120 million as publicly already tendered and has been issued. 120 million kina. All the roads have already been built. All the hotels have been built, Mr. Speaker. That's what is required for the city. Now you can see the private sector has come in because they have confidence where the opposition leader does not have the confidence. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Other issues on the floor of Parliament this afternoon were the alignment of the budget and concerns about land title owners versus ILG registration. These issues were raised by member for Sinestine Yongomu and Bulolo respectively. Uh, can the Treasurer give us some assurance that he will be able to align the revenue with the expenditure so that we can be able to fully execute the budget 
before the end of the year. That's number one. And number two, uh, can you give some assurance that within the remaining two months that he is confident of being able to raise that revenue? I can assure the honorable member that when the year ends, the government will balance its books and there is no reason to uh, press on a panic button. Uh, all I can say is that warrants are being released. Government is paying its bills, including wages and salaries, including salaries for members of parliament. Uh, the commitment of government has been entertained. I want to assure the honorable members that uh, in consultation with the prime minister, we have taken a decision to uh, make sure that the commitment we have for all our programs are met, including the disbursement of uh, PSIP, DSIP funds. Uh, so I can assure the Honorable House and the people of our country that government is in control and by the time we close our books on the 26th of December, government will balance its books and we will no doubt meet all of our commitments. Urban areas. Uh, recently in, in Lay City and along the Lay City Highway, uh, including some urban areas in the districts, uh, landowners that are registering the ILGs uh, with the help of some retired uh, lands officers of the provincial government are advising uh, land title holders, and I'm talking about some big companies that, that are really contributing to the, um, to the nation, uh, that they're approaching them, uh, telling them that uh, once they are issued the ILG registration, all the land titles that are issued to those companies and uh, businesses small to medium along the highway and also in within the precinct of the um, urban areas will be nullified. And that has forced some landowners um, uh, blocking the gates of those companies. And uh, I believe that, uh, Mr. Speaker, can the minister um, uh, clarify this matter? Because uh, if it is true, I can see that there is a big legal um, uh, fight against the lands department by those companies. State lease is uh, given out for 99 year lease, 99 year lease. So it doesn't affect, uh, affect them. They can lease that up until the 99-year lease expires, and they can apply for extension. Uh, so to answer your question, no, it does not affect the state lease. Two high-priority road projects were highlighted in Parliament today. They include the Milford Haven Road in Ley and the East Cape Road in Mill Bay. Ley MP Lujaya Koza opened question time today with her questions for Works Minister Francis Awesa. The government continues to be questioned by the opposition over major road projects in the country. Lay MP Luzaya Koza queried the construction of the Milford Haven Road in Lay City and how soon it would be completed. Will you have the Bumayong Unitech Road and the Milford Haven Road sealed before 2017 election? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The East Cape Road will cost 89 million kina to upgrade and seal a stretch of 51 kilometers on the most easterly point of PNG's mainland. The Lay MP demanded answers from the Works Minister of its tendering process. Your justification on the awarding of um, this recognition to these two roads when we have outstanding with regards to uh, economic viability and what not factor, what was your uh, criteria used? Works Minister Francis Awesa gave a brief statement clarifying that both roads will be completed. So I want to assure the member that uh, this is under control. We will be attending to that, those two remaining sections. Uh, uh, between now and then uh, June next year. He also made specific statements that legal processes were followed for the East Cape Road, which is an understanding between ADB, Australian government and the PNG government. Because uh, some of this um, uh, funding that is coming from donor agencies, we must be grateful how they uh, go about doing their business. The Wex Minister was also grilled over roads in Central Province but stated that appropriate funding will be sourced to maintain the roads. Jack Lapave, Junior National, MTV News. 
Moving away from Parliament and leaders from five villages in the Bulolo district who will be affected by the Wafi Gopu project have called on the national government to fast track the hearing of the Land Titles Commission to determine the ownership of the land on which the future mine sits. They have also called on the national government to outline plans for the development of a township in the Mumang Bulolo area. Leaders from five villages gathered at Guraco along the Lei Bulolo Highway calling on the national government to fast-track a lands title commission hearing. The reason? To determine the owners of the land on which the Wafi Gopu project is. The concerns are long-standing and have come to the fore again as work towards completing one of the largest mines in Papua New Guinea progresses. They've also raised concerns about the future benefits of the mine, seeking clarification from the Mineral Resource Authority as to where a township, if any, will be built in the Bulolo district. This law something. Emma before me plato. Yes and no. The leaders of the villages previously called for a response from the national government but got none. And they're among several groups claiming ownership of the land on which the mine will be developed. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Lay. You're watching National MTV News. More local stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Department of Community Development, Youth and Religion has come forward to assist the PNG Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. President of the PNG Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Avia Khoisen, thanked Secretary Anna Solomon for the positive response in donating much needed furniture. Ms. Khoisen said the assistance will support the Chamber's ongoing work in training and mentoring women build strong businesses. The Department of Community Development donated furniture like chairs, cabinets and tables to the chamber in response to a request. I am very pleased uh, to say that the secretary and through uh, his executive manager this morning have now brought this uh, equipment and the chamber would like to thank the Department of Community um, Development uh, and, and um, we would also like to thank the government for its continuous support to the chamber. Ms. Koisen took the time to call on women interested in registering for training to visit the office on the first floor of the Jacks of PNG building opposite Stop and Shop Waigani Central. I know that uh, these materials that have been donated, a couple of chairs and cabinets and, and, and tables, will be put to good use to help our women to train them in programs like uh, financial literacy, general viability, food sanitation, um, and a number of other, other uh, courses that we are running. Joe Iraqi, executive manager from the Office of the Secretary, said the Department of Community Development is focused on issues of women, children, and people living with disabilities, concentrating on areas of policy and legislation. He said the department was proud to support the chamber. So as a department, we cannot reach out to uh, every every agency out there who is actively involved in the area of women, children, and disability. But whatever little we have, we try to uh, help in little ways. So this is uh, one of the little ways that we have decided to help the PNG Chamber of Women. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. Two former employees of the Western Highlands Provincial Administration have been charged for three counts of abuse of office, misappropriation and conspiracy. It is alleged that more than 1.3 million kina was misappropriated from the provincial operating account and provincial treasury as cash advances. These were alleged to have occurred between March 2013 and August 2014. Pictures of wanted persons or detainees who escape from cell blocks will be posted on notice boards at the eight police stations in Port Moresby. NCD Metropolitan Superintendent Ben Turi said this is the approach the command is taking to recapture those who escape from police custody. 
This approach is aimed at getting the community to assist police recapture criminals who escape from police custody. The NCD command is taking this stand because of the increase in wanted persons going into hiding. The eight station commanders in the NCD command were advised on this last week and directions were issued to execute the order. All the wanted uh, statistics of all the pe people that is uh, that, that's wanted and said, have been giving the information, so every station will have all uh, these ones now on the notice board. The NCD Metropolitan Superintendent explained that though the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary is the law enforcing agency in the country, it cannot track down all wanted persons. Thus, he urged what must be residents to assist police with information to recapture those who have gone into hiding. Some pictures of those categorized as wanted have already been placed on notice boards at the stations. I look at those gang leaders and uh, profile them. We have already profiled some of them and we continue profiling them for uh, police officers at the station level. To uh, This one is a uh, well-known from Geru, Napo. He's still on the run. Meanwhile, there are new police station commanders for Geru, Waigani, Six Mile and the Port Mosby stations. Takla Gunga, National MTV News. A court ruling on the sufficiency of evidence against three senior policemen will be delivered by Senior Magistrate Cosmas Bida on November 9th. This follows submissions made this morning before the Waigani Committal Court. The three accused are Henry Nayo, Philip Pokop and Tony Kande, are alleged to have threatened to kill and fired gunshots at another policeman in 2014. Their lawyer submitted to the court that their arrest and charging occurred on different dates, 70 months after the, the alleged offence. However, the police prosecutor told the court the accused were arrested at different times because the investigations took longer than expected. And now looking at our finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.4025 Australian dollars, 0.2802 Euro and 31.77 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee and copper closed higher while cocoa closed the day lower. Palm oil closed higher while crude oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 77.32 points higher, the ASX is trading at 34.32 points higher, and the Ordinaries is trading at 34.24 points higher. Here with Tuesday's news, the U.S. gives advice on human trafficking, Taiwan medical aid brings relief to central villages, and Japanese embassy awards grant. Those stories and more after the break. Welcome back to the news. PNG is getting more advice from the United States on human trafficking. A U.S. State Department official is in the country this week to discuss PNG's efforts against human trafficking in the country. Kendra Kreider works as a reports and political affairs officer within the U.S. State Department, where she provides advice on how U.S. foreign policy can help combat human trafficking. Um, here in PNG, there's a lot of different types of human trafficking that people are only just becoming aware of. Um, the prostitution of children is a challenge um, in a lot of places and one that, one that we've seen here. Also, the forced labor of children, children that are forced to um, either sometimes in domestic servitude, in domestic roles in houses, or working in markets, or providing other types of labor. Um, also, um, for both local and foreign men and women, there is forced labor and sex trafficking near mining and logging camps, and also in the fishing industry. Logging and mining areas around the world and in the Pacific have become hotspots for human trafficking. Also of particular interest is the fishing industry. One of the challenges in the fishing industry is that a lot of the 
boats that have forced labor victims on them might be fishing illegally. Mm -hmm. And so what happened here in PNG last year and what has happened in other countries is that these boats might be picked up and apprehended for other types of violations, for immigration crimes or illegal fishing crimes, where the trafficking victims might actually end up being charged as criminals because there isn't an awareness and understanding yet that some of these people are actually being forced to commit crimes and are actually victims of human trafficking. Crida will meet with the National Human Trafficking Committee and other stakeholders to discuss progress in this area. I shared with your government um, a set of recommended actions for this coming year um, to, try to, to try to help guide those efforts. Um, and we also have programming that we provide to help support the government. And so my office currently has a project with the International Organization on Migration, um, IOM, that's operating here in Papua New Guinea and is helping officials um, to identify victims and develop some of these standard procedures to combat human trafficking. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. The Japanese embassy in Port Moresby has donated over 800 million kina for the construction of new classrooms and a resource center in the country. Recipients of the grant signed the instruments today in Port Moresby in the presence of Japanese ambassador Morio Matsumoto. Eric Harupa with this report. The four recipients are Warabung Primary School in Isipik Province, Laigam Elementary School in Enga Province, Ugu Primary School in Ela Province, and Foundation for Rural Development in Jiwaka. His Excellency Mario Matsumoto, Ambassador of Japan to Papua New Guinea, signed the contracts witnessed by representatives from these organizations at the Embassy in Port Mosby. Three schools and the local NGO for uh, being uh, the successful recipients of our grants, uh, which will go towards addressing your needs for new facilities, both the schools and uh, the center. This year, the Japanese government has extended a total amount of U.S. 265,845 U.S. dollars, equivalent to 821,468 kina. Mr. Matsumoto says the government of Japan sees education as a priority area for human resource development in the future through this course. This assistance was part of the Japanese Embassy Grant Assistance for Grassroots Human Security Projects called GGP, which comes annually. GGP targets to empower people through the improved education and life skills through infrastructure development enshrined in Vision 2050. So far, 279 projects have been funded under this program. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. Villages of the Kuali Morobu village in the central province are the first beneficiaries of free medical services delivered by the Taiwan Root Medical Corps in PNG. The aid came as a blessing to the villagers who said even basic health care for them was very costly because of the distance they have to travel just to be treated. Kirobu Ward to Councillor Tabina Roma, one of many villagers who lined up outside a small community hall in Kuali Murubu village seeking medical help, was very thankful. He had brought his cousin Inara Kaibe to surgically remove fat lumps from beneath the skin of his forehead and his abdomen. After 30 minutes of surgery, Kaibe, still drowsy from the mini operation, was able to tell MTV how much of a relief it was after years of disappointing visits to the hospital. The medical team is a non-government organization that delivers basic health care and the services, fortunately for the villagers, were extended beyond just basic services. At times, they were limited to the availability of volunteer doctors and specialists. They are working with the NDOH to provide primary medical care to Papua New Guineans in rural areas. 
part of the government's commitment to deliver subsidized health services under the SDG goals. According to NDOH medical offices, this visit serves as a pilot project and paves the way for a more concrete agreement between the organization and the PNG government for other provinces to benefit from. The Department of Health anticipates that the project alone will help over 2,000 people from eight villages in the central province. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. Turning overseas with the U.S. Election Day only 14 days away, residents of Texas and Kansas lined up at early voting polling stations to cast their ballot yesterday. Residents made their way to polling centers in San Angelo and San Antonio in Texas, one of the key battleground states in this year's U.S. presidential elections. Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton has maintained a lead in battleground states of Florida and Pennsylvania, while Ohio, another battleground state, remains too close to call. Analysts say lower voter turnout generally benefits Trump, but his best hope for success is if Republican turnout surges and Democratic turnout is low. Nancy, a day of Topeka, Kansas, decided to use the option of casting her vote early because she did not want to take any chances. I just think it's fun to have the opportunity to come in first. Plus, I always think if you wait till the last minute, what if something happens that you're not able to make it in? You've gotten sick, you've run out of gas, you've been in an accident, whatever. Kay Anderson, another Topeka resident, wanted to be part of this election where former Secretary of State Clinton is ahead of the New York businessmen in national opinion polls. If I want to complain about what they're doing, I need to vote. If I don't vote, I don't feel I have a right to complain because I didn't take part. Clinton maintained her commanding lead in the race to win the Electoral College and claim the presidency. According to the latest Reuters Ipso State of the Nation project results released on Saturday. In the last week, there has been little movement. Clinton leads Donald Trump in most of the states that Trump would need should he have the chance to win the minimum 270 votes needed to win. According to the project, she has a better than 95 percent chance of winning if the election was held this week. The most likely outcome would be 326 votes for Clinton to 212 for Trump. Vanessa Knight, MTV World News. Here at National MTV News, up next we have Chukai Sports and an assurance that all venues will be ready for the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports Welcome to Chukai Sports. Minister for, Minister for Sports Justin Tichenko has confirmed the venues for the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup will be ready. Over the next 14 days, contractors will be finishing off the venues for inspections. Most of the finals of the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup will be held at the National Football Stadium. The is being um, upgraded uh, to in being games ready for um, that event. Of course, the John Guy Stadium's already with the other mini stadium there as well. Final cleanup and construction of the venues will be done over the next two weeks. Minister for Sports and National Events, Justin Chachenko, says the facilities will leave a lasting legacy after the World Cup. The new mini stadium built at the Sir John Guy Stadium will be football's new home. This will be the first time football will have a home ground in Port Moresby. The new mini stadium there will be the new home for football. And I'm proud to say that after the FIFA World Cup, they will be utilised for football's uh, training facilities, uh, for their matches and for their office. So we're looking forward in working with football. Also, Rugby Union will have good facilities to use after the World Cup. Rugby Union matches and training will be held at the new mini stadium built at Bava Park. It'll be fantastic. We'll have the main ground here and then the training grounds uh, on the other side. So uh, a great, uh, great result from the FIFA World Cup, also leaving legacy uh, projects and infrastructure uh, for the benefit of other sports as well. Justin Chichenko, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill and Port Moresby Governor Powis Parkop will be officially opening the venues over the next few weeks. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. 
Construction on the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium will continue over the next few months. Work came to a halt after Curtin Brothers' owner, Sir Michael Curtin, fell ill, which led to his recent passing. Since his passing, the government has spoken to the Curtin family and will be moving on with the project. The construction of the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium was a private-public partnership project and Sir Curtin's company was in charge. With the project to continue, the government is seeking sponsorship and funding from BSP to finish off the main grandstand. Um, which is in process as we speak, uh, waiting for NEC approval um, and BSP will get naming rights and uh, other, other situations uh, with, uh, with the um, Hubert Murray Stadium. New trustees for the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium will be appointed to take care of the facilities. Some new appointments um, with the passing of Sir Michael Curtin, who was the chairman. So we need to put a, a good uh, a professional um, minded and business minded uh, chairman in place to take uh, the Hubert Murray Stadium Trust and the construction forward. The Hubert Murray Stadium will be a commercial entity where they will have to make money to look after the facilities. It will be the biggest stadium in PNG with a seating capacity of 20,000 people. Uh, it is a commercial entity. Uh, it will have eight uh, restaurant outlets. It will have um, uh, conference and meeting facilities. Um, it will have be the home of um, weightlifting, and many other things. So there'll be more there to raise revenues. We'll have uh, supporter boxes and it will work in with football, it will work in with rugby, uh, and, and that's union and also um, uh, league and other sports. Uh. Chachenko reaffirmed that the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium will be ready for use before the Rugby League World Cup 2017. It looks the same. Elijah Lavet, National MTV Sports. With the October 31st deadline approaching for all venues to be ready to host the FIFA Women's Under-20 World Cup, PNG Sports Foundation CEO Peter Tsamalili Jr. says the venues will be handed over to the local organizing committee as of next week. Meanwhile, PNG coach Lisa Cole called on football followers in the country to rally their support behind the PNG Women's Under-20 side. By next Monday, the venue management for the National Football Stadium, Bava Mini Stadium at the Bissini Prison, the Sir John Guy Stadium, and the nearby PNG Football Stadium will be handed over to the local organizing committee, headed by Chairman Seamus Martin. This is to allow the various teams set up by the LOC to move in and take carriage of the venues, with the FIFA officials, who should all be in Port Moresby by this week, to take charge in running the 8th edition of the biannual International Women's Youth Football Championships. Meanwhile, PNG coach Lisa Cole said PNG will go up against countries that have thorough development programs, which are second to none, and it is important for the soccer followers in the country to appreciate the PNG Under-20 women's preparation leading up to the event. Cole said despite the mammoth task ahead of them, PNG will play the current format of goalkeeper 4-2-3-1. This will be the main shape of the lineup, but would shift depending on when the team was attacking or defending. As spare the draw, the opening matches on November 13 are Sweden against North Korea and PNG versus Brazil at the Sir John Guy Stadium, while at the Bava Mini Stadium, Spain will take on Canada, and early favorites Japan meet Nigeria. Tickets are on sale online and for the general public, tickets will start selling in November. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. You're watching Chukai Sports. We'll be back with more after the break. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Deferred in light of recent events, especially surrounding the withdrawal of nominations and a non-declaration of a presidential candidate, the PNG RFU board has felt it necessary to defer the AGM until such time necessary information has been received. The requirements by PNG RFU state that member unions will be required to submit documentation with a particular focus on financial reports with governance a priority. PNG RFU General Manager Frank Genia, however, has cited political interference as a hindrance to the smooth processes of the election. This, however, has prompted Minister for Sport Justin Chichenko to push all parties involved for immediate action. To get their administration and management in order. They have to get the board in order. Now, under the, their constitution, 
it clearly states, crystal clear, that they must have a board meeting and an AGM ASAP to elect the new um, board, uh, the board members this month. You know, you've got to start questioning what have they got to hide? What are they not telling us? What's the situation that is uh, so important that you have to defer it to January? I don't buy by their, um, their uh, queries or what have you. The rules are there, regulations are there, follow it. NG RFU in response acknowledged Tachenko's concern, however, maintains their call on the AGM. I respect his, his views and his comments, uh, but secondly, I guess more importantly, uh, the board uh, is, is resolute. Uh, we have our uh, independent processes in place here. Uh, we, we would like to complete our due diligence uh, on all the presidential candidates. And, you know, it's, it's a simple governance process that is done across all organisations. So as far as the office is concerned, uh, we aren't doing anything wrong. In the meantime, the PNG RFU board has maintained its decision to defer the AGM with interim president Ben Frame posing it as an opportunity for unions to comply with governance practices which also fall directly in line with voting requirements. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. The PNG RFU has released a customised Palais team for this year's Fiji tour. Brisbane-based sisters Marlugu and Harkana Dixon make a comeback to both the 15s and 7s side, while PNG's first ever woman to play professional rugby in Europe, Melanie Kawa, makes her debut for her motherland. Following the National Provincial Championships, a new and accustomed Palais squad has been released for the upcoming World Cup qualifier and the Oceania Sevens Championship in Fiji. Looking to move this thing around the place. Pacific Games gold medalist exactly in boxing, <laughs> Debbie Carra makes her comeback to and the code alongside Kimli Rapila, Joanne Lagona and Cassandra Sampson. All the Dixon sisters, Hakana and Malugu return after close to a year of absence in the national side. In the 15-woman format, a number of newbies have been introduced, with PNG superstar Melanie Kawa making her debut. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. The Tongan government has reaffirmed its commitment to host the 2019 Pacific Games in 2019. Tongan Prime Minister Akilisi Poheva's recent comments reflect the enormous challenges that the government of Tonga is facing in preparation for the Pacific Games in 2019. However, the government has continued to strengthen and double the effort that has already been in operation, utilizing the resources available. This will provide an invaluable opportunity for the Kingdom of Tonga to upgrade its sporting facilities to international level to benefit its people. And that's a wrap for Trukai Sport. Up next, your weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay tuned. Trukai Sport. Trukai Sport. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, a shower or two in Port Moresby, chances of rain showers in Kerama, rain showers clearing in Daru and Popandata and rain showers in Alotau. In the Momasi region, chances of thundery showers in Leh, thundery showers clearing in Medang and chances of rain showers in Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, rain showers and thunderstorms in Kimbe, Kavieng, Rabaul and Buka, and rain showers with possible thunderstorms in Loringau. And in the Highlands region, thundery showers in all centres. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield, with doing with Dulux. Now recapping our main stories for tonight.
Parliament session begins with questions on APEC, budget and LNG entitlements. Bulolo district leaders want land titles commission hearing and national events minister says FIFA venues will be ready. And that's the news, sports and weather for tonight, Tuesday, October 25th of 2016. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>